Hello and welcome to Ahead of the Curve. This is your host, Jonathan Gellner, and this episode is powered by Stick and Ball TV. I'm excited to announce that Ahead of the Curve is now part of the Stick and Ball TV family. Stick and Ball TV is the baseball and softball streaming platform dedicated to coach and player development. It features hundreds of videos from top baseball and softball coaches and leading brands. There are literally hundreds of videos across all parts of the game, and I am so thankful to be a part of the community that they have built. We want you to join the community so bad that we are giving away one free month to each of you. Use the code AOTC2021 for a free month and check it out at Stick and Ball TV or on the Stick and Ball app on the App Store. Once again, that's AOTC2021, all lowercase. On today's show, we have on Keith Law, senior baseball writer for The Athletic. Keith previously wrote for ESPN.com and ESPN Scouts, Inc. and for Baseball Prospectus. He also worked in the front office for the Toronto Blue Jays from 2002 to 2006. So on the show, we discuss scouting and its role in player development, which includes a discussion on what traits can be taught and what can't. Then we take a deep dive into analytics and what Keith thinks could be the most impactful information over the next decade. Here is Keith Law. Keith, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Definitely. Well, I'm really excited to pick your brain today as I was you know, talking just a second ago about how we come from two completely different worlds of baseball, but you know, the beautiful game of baseball that it is has brought us together today. And it's something that we mutually love and then collectively as well. But, you know, for our listeners, you're kind of a little bit out of, you know, the typical guests that I have, which is, you know, coaches and and player and people in player development on a daily basis. And so I'm really excited to get to hear your perspective on different things, because again, you, you do a great job in the space that you're in. And I know that that you will help bring in some different things that will help tie it into, you know, what, what the listeners listen to, which is, you know, how do we make players better? And so I, I'm, I'm excited about that, but I was doing a little background on you and, and I knew that you're a writer, but I did not know that you were an econ and, and sociology major and you graduated from Harvard. So how in the heck did you get into the game of baseball? I mean, really, honestly, the, the degree, and I, I mean, I have a master's from, the Tepper school at Carnegie Mellon too, none of that really has any bearing on me getting into baseball and only sort of has some marginal connections to the stuff that I do now, the writing that I do now. And certainly I would say even less when I was working for the front office of the Blue Jays, I was just doing freelance writing on the side for baseball prospectus and ESPN. And through some connections, I got to talking to JP Ricciardi who had just been hired as the GM of the Blue Jays, and he was looking for somebody to handle some, what I would say is, but by today's standards, very light statistical work, but to provide mm-hmm. also a counterbalancing voice to the scouting side. And when, when Ricciardi took over with the Blue Jays, he didn't really have many of his own scouts. He inherited a staff, and he just wanted somebody who was his, who who he'd actually brought in. Uh, as he, over time, also tried to remake the scouting staff as well, which he did. And so I was at a point in my life and career where you know I was working for some high-tech firms. I did not enjoy it um, and was able to take that leap and spent four and a half years with the Jays. There were some, some positives and negatives, I would say. Uh, by the end, the negatives were outweighing the positives enough that – and I was about to become a father – and wanted to get a job with some more stability, a little more autonomy, especially in terms of my travel. And I found out ESPN was looking for somebody to fill the job that eventually I filled for the next 13 years. No, I love that. And I can, you know, go back to the Keith Law chats on ESPN. And I remember reading those, uh, I think it was every Thursday at like one o'clock. And I remember going those, going through those on my lunch break. And so it's, Mm -hmm. it's, I go back to reading your stuff for, for a long time. And, and so I do appreciate everything that you, you know, you've done to grow our game. And so with that, what is your background in baseball? Did you play baseball? And then, you know, I want to know how you learned the intricacies of it because you go from, 
you know, you, you may have you know, played as an amateur, which I'm sure you'll tell us here in just a second. But that's a that's a big difference from scouting major league baseball players. And so tell us a little bit about your journey of why you decided to get into it. And then how did you learn about the intricacies of the game to get to that next level? Uh, it's it's kind of not that interesting. No, I did not play as a kid. Um, I was and this might be a little bit more about me than anybody wanted to know, but uh, for one thing, I was very young for my grade. I skipped first grade. So I only turned 17 three weeks before I graduated from high school. And so I was already at a at an age disadvantage for playing mm-hmm. sports, but I'm also just kind of small. My you know, parents are both pretty small. Uh, my partner and I, we, we, we say we're not small, we're fun-sized. We are fun-sized mm-hmm. people. And what I discovered later when my daughter was born is that uh, because she – got the neonatal screening for some genetic disorders, uh, the long process found out. I also have one uh, that is an organic acidemia that the short version that's relevant to this question is that it's hard for us to build and maintain the kind of muscle tone that would be required to play sports at a pretty competitive level. For whatever reason, my daughter seems to actually be a little bit better in that department than I am. Um, I have learned as an adult just from exercising that I just don't hold on to muscle mass as long as, or as, as easily as most adult men would. And it's fine. It doesn't really affect my daily life, but it would mean that playing, you know, it meant for example, that I wasn't as strong as most of my classmates. In fact, I was probably not as strong as any of my classmates when I was growing up. So I wanted to play sports. I liked running, um, but couldn't, didn't have the stamina to be able to continue running. I loved baseball. Baseball has been my favorite sport since I was old enough to sit up on the couch and watch the 78 and 77 world series with my mom, who's the bigger baseball fan of my two parents. Okay. But, uh, you know, again, it requires baseball in particular. This has sort of actually gone into one of my long held uh, theories about players is that, you know, we look for players who are muscular. We look for players with big biceps. It's like, I want players with strong hands because guess what? I had, I have actually pretty small hands and not, you know, I don't have the kind of hand or wrist strength that you'd really want to see for somebody to be able to swing a bat quickly, especially a heavier bat and drive the ball. So it meant that, yeah, I tried to play with friends. I played little league briefly and I was like, I suck. I'm just really not good at this. And I will say I am the type of person where if I'm really terrible at something right away, I'll probably just quit and never do it again. And grew up a fan, remained a fan got into fantasy baseball, just became like an obsessive baseball fan, in addition to being kind of a general fan of most sports when I was a kid, basically anything except basketball. And then um, never really lost that. It was just a baseball fan kind of forever and was got involved in some of the internet baseball communities in the mid-90s. And that's how I got hooked up with the early baseball prospectus group and started doing some stuff for them just on the side as I was working, going to school. So that was my kind of roundabout path. I wish I could tell you I played and had some some really fun stories from my amateur career, but it just wasn't meant to be. And I've always said, I think it was just not in the cards for me genetically. So I found another way into the sport. Oh, that's wonderful. And again, I, I love getting to hear your background with within that. And so you talked about joining Baseball Prospectus in like the early nineties. And so you were, uh, you were way ahead of the analytics train, it seems like, and again, doing some research about it, you, you know, you were talking about that in the early to mid nineties. And so just what, what really brought that on? Like what piqued your curiosity with analytics? Um, it was about just being smarter about baseball. I mean, that's, it, it is honestly as simple as that. It was that I am not, you know, it, and some of it was about playing fantasy baseball too. Like, I just want to be better at this. Why am I not, better at playing this silly game. Why are the things that I think I know about baseball often not and about players specifically, why did they turn out to not be true? And sort of this discovery, it's like, hey, the stuff everyone told me when I was a kid, the stuff the newspaper told me, the stuff the broadcasters told me about wins and RBIs and saves. Like, wait a minute, is none of that true? You know, we I think a lot of people go through disillusionment on lots of things, on politics, on religion, on just culture, as they go as they enter adolescence or enter early adulthood. That was also true for me in terms of baseball and I think sports in general. I just started to realize there was a lot of really nonsense in the uh, in the world of, of baseball commentary and what passed for baseball analysis then. And I was a little late getting into Bill James and his 
progeny in the world of sort of better baseball writing. But then I threw myself completely into it. I said, wait, I love this stuff. This stuff speaks to me. This is rational, analytical, evidence-based thinking about baseball. And that's kind of how I am in lots of areas of life. I want uh, everything to be evidence-based. I want to make decisions in my own life that are evidence-based. It's not always easy to do, obviously, but I want to try. I got it. I love it. And so we went through, you know, the Moneyball era and then, you know, steroid era, Moneyball era and all of the, all of these different things. And so you, you kind of start to see the way and, and the, we'll see the way that, that the game is going and, and trending. And so with, with your expertise and your knowledge, you're in it every day and this is, this is what you love to do. Mm-hmm. And so I, I'm really curious about it from you because, you know, I'm a baseball coach and, and I am on a different side of it. I, you know, I want to understand analytics and I want to be able to use those on a daily basis to help players develop. Mm -hmm. And so if you were going to try and predict kind of, you know, where are we, where are we maybe getting it wrong? Where are, where, what does the next wave look like of, cause we go through these different waves in baseball and these, you know, these different trends that are really popular and then everybody tries to adhere to those and then it becomes no longer the outliers. And it's like the group that we're trying to, anyways, it, it go, it ebbs and flows. And so if you had to, if you had to just kind of maybe and you could be wrong because I think that we all are in our careers about different things, but what are some different things or trends that you see over the next decade that, that are going to be really important? I think it started already. And I know you've worked a little bit in a professional organization. You, you probably know quite a bit about this, but that as the stat cast track man and similar systems, other devices or systems that, try to measure more granular, more, uh, more granular details about players, and especially more physical details about player mechanics and or the movement and direction spin, et cetera, of the baseball itself. That is dramatically changing both scouting and player development. I think that's already started. But I also think we are so early in that process that we are very much still learning. And I have had People, when I was researching smart baseball a couple of years ago, had a, an analytics uh, director, an R&D director for a major league team, tell me one of the problems that they would run into is they would find what they thought was maybe a little inefficiency or a little advantage, something about players. Players who do X, Y, Z are more valuable maybe than anybody else realizes. You have to act on that hypothesis before there's really enough evidence to prove it, because if you wait, the efficiency or the window closes. So I should say the inefficiency, your opportunity in the market, these opportunities are very fleeting. It is very much for any listeners who uh, know much about the world of finance or have worked in that world. It's a bit like arbitrage where you know a stock that's worth $19.02 in New York is selling for $19.04 in London for a few minutes or even seconds. And so you buy in New York and you sell in London, you sell huge quantities. So you make a lot of money off of what is just a temporary blip of the same stock being sold for two different values in two different places. It's a bit like that. You have to jump quick because eventually the market realizes, hey, pitchers who do X, Y, Z are really valuable and your opportunity is gone. And that may mean you chase some chimeras too that are just not real. You may chase some things that that turn out to not actually pan out over time. Sure. But as it, but now we're we're collecting more and more data, and more teams are using very more various devices. More companies are innovating and entering the market with different devices to measure certain things about about players, about their mechanics, about the baseball's movement. And so, I feel like we are in a cycle, an upward cycle for now, at least, of gathering more information. So our sample sizes and our numbers of years of data are increasing, but also that we're just getting new types of information. So. You know, the biggest problem when I've spoken to R&D folks, the biggest problem they tell me is that it's not that we lack data. It's that we're, we're still, we have so much coming in and we have to clean it, store it, organize it, and then figure out how to deploy it. And that comes down to player development where I think each team has its own things they believe are more valuable. And then you have to translate that. I mean, it's all well and good for an R&D guy to say, hey, a pitcher who does this with the baseball is going to be more valuable. But then you have to find a way to actually teach guys to do that with the baseball. Or if you have some guys who can already do that, teach them maybe to do it and still throw strikes. So 
you know, it's, it's very easy to come to, relatively speaking, I should say, easy to come to these conclusions in the laboratory, but actually sure. putting into practice on the field, even on the practice fields, is another challenge entirely. Well, and that's a great point. And, and something that, that I want to ask you too is, is that, you know, you want, you want to be the, you, well, some would argue that you want to be the first adopter because it's an advantage, but is that also uh, uh, something that could be dangerous? Yes. Yeah. You could end up spending time and money chasing something that's not real. And even more in the uh, player development, um, on the player development side, you could mess somebody up. Like what if you, yeah. what if somebody We're decided that, yeah, there's some new pitch, right? And this this pitch is going to be super effective and you teach a bunch of guys that pitch and suddenly you end up with a couple of arm injuries. I mean, the, the Rangers went through a stretch where they tried something different on the player development side and suddenly f- multiple guys blew their elbows out. High draft picks were blowing their elbows out. One of them blew out twice. So yeah, that's kind of, I mean, that there's a risk. There's a risk in, the, in there's a business risk, but I would also say that's a human risk too. These, these, are, these are employees. They're not assets. There are actual people whose lives and careers are altered by the decisions that you might make. Definitely. Well, I, I want to switch roles uh, or, or I guess switch gears a little bit as far as uh, the line of questioning and talk about your role with the Blue Jays is, you know, you were in player development and you worked your way up for, I can't remember the exact role that you started with, but you got, you know, your, your last job with them was the assistant to the GM. So you saw a lot of different areas of professional baseball and player development. Mm-hmm. So tell us a little bit about your role there and, and just kind of walk through your, your journey and, and what you've learned. Um, yeah, I would say I had less visibility into player development than anything else while I was there. I was the status okay. department. That's really what I, gotcha. you know, for, for lack of any better description. At the time, you know, all the data that we would, that we had to which we had access would fit on my laptop. I could run stuff in Access and Excel and you know, I didn't need anything more sophisticated. And I wrote some code myself just to make dealing with these flat files a little easier. But the data, the size of the of a year's worth of data was not very big. Now, now it's, I mean, these are data warehousing problems. So it's something completely different uh, that these teams are dealing with and they need armies of people. There are R&D departments that can be up to 20 employees who are working with this data. So that's, right. that itself is very different. And I was involved essentially just in an advisory role. I did not get to make any actual direct decisions, but I would advise on all kinds of player acquisition. I would advise on the draft. I would get a little bit involved in trying to you know, negotiate some of the contracts for the pre-arbitration guys on the major league roster. Uh, I would sometimes be in the room or, or on the phone calls uh, where my boss was negotiating directly with agents. I wasn't doing, I wasn't saying anything at that point. I was there to listen and maybe provide you know, some ammunition after the fact, for example. And after a couple of years though, really after the first year, I, uh, I tried to go to some minor league games in my first year, in addition to going to major league games, but also it was pretty clear. I didn't really know what I was looking at. So by the second year, and at that point, Tony LaCava, who's still with the Blue Jays had joined the organization. I felt like I needed to get some kind of background in scouting. Uh, The first reason was just that I'm, I'm sitting in a room, people are talking and I don't know the language. I don't really understand what they're talking about. I mean, I sort of understand, but not really. And second was, by my third draft, it was pretty clear that our, to me, that our strategy of really just going after college players with good track records of performance was not working. We were culling the draft pool far too heavily, so there just weren't enough players left. And we were missing on some guys who could come into pro ball and improve. Uh, that we were, you know, and I mean, we never had a shot at him, but Justin Verlander to me is a good example where there were guys in our draft room with real concerns about uh, about his secondary stuff and whether he'd throw enough strikes. He was big, he was strong, he threw super hard. He did miss a lot of bats. It's not that we didn't like him, but did we really think he was the first or second best player in that draft class? I remember there being some debate, even though it was academic, about that. Well, Verlander to me is a great example of a guy, especially coming out of a mid-major school. It's not a great you know, historically productive baseball program in terms of creating big leaguers. But then he got in a pro ball, got out of that environment, got in a pro ball, made a few adjustments, and obviously he's Justin Verlander now. We would miss those guys. We would miss those guys in the second and third and fourth rounds too because we were looking for guys who were essentially already developed. Well, one, that's not showing a whole lot of faith in your player development department, and that's probably a whole different conversation that probably I shouldn't have because some of those people still work in baseball. And 
uh, the, you know, let's just say it was, I thought, pretty denigrating to say, you, we're not even going to give you guys to develop because obviously we don't think you're capable of it, which is not really very good on multiple levels. But also that, um, you know, it just, it robbed us of opportunities. And by the time we'd get to the fifth round in the draft, you know, I'd say, I remember turning to Tony Lukava at one point saying, everybody we liked is gone. What, what, you know, why are we still here? Should we just pass the rest of the way? Obviously we didn't do that, but the, the problem was we were artificially constraining our draft pool. And I thought, you know, we need to reincorporate traditional methods of evaluation, which is still data. It's just a totally different kind of data, but it's useful in those are useful inputs when trying to evaluate players and felt like we needed to get out and um, I needed to get out and learn this stuff better. And if I could go see players and throw more scouting reports into the system, great. But it was also for me about being better able to speak that language and understand what our re- our, our actual scouts were coming back and telling us about the players they saw all summer, all fall, all spring, so that maybe we would make better decisions and we would no longer severely cut off our player pool. And by 2006, the year that I left, uh, they had started doing that. And I'm not taking credit for it. it. Just they, I think they also realized our drafts were becoming less productive. And they took a high school player, Travis Snyder, in the first round, who got to the big leagues, didn't quite work out. But I think that was a, an important philosophical shift uh, that continued even after J.P. Ricciardi was let go a few years later. And Alex Anthopoulos took over, and he was much more willing to take on some risks in the higher part of the draft. And I think the draft results from his tenure really bear out the you know what I believed and what others believed in the front office, which which was that we needed to be considering both types of information and expand the pool of potential players. Well, that's really interesting, and there's a couple different things that I want to ask you about that. But the uh, the first thing is is you know hypothetically speaking, is there a guy that you were do you remember beating your hands on the desk that you're like we've got to get this guy, and then he turned out to be you know obviously a, an everyday big leaguer or somebody that that you remember that that it's like, man, that was a guy that we could have gotten, but we, you know, this or that happened. I mean, the story is not a secret that I was in the draft room for um, when Troy Tulowitzki was in the draft and I absolutely wanted him. And uh, the room was split. It was close to 50-50, but J.P. Ricciardi went to see Tulowitzki and, and Romero, Ricky Romero himself. And Tulowitzki was just coming off a wrist injury and didn't play all that well. And Romero did what he did basically every Friday night, his junior year, pitched exceptionally well and was very polished and limited upside, but you kind of thought you knew what you were going to get. And, um, you know, I wanted Tulowitzki. I was not the only one. And I had seen Tulowitzki myself. I was a big believer in, I knew he'd stay at shortstop. He had a great arm. I thought he was going to hit for power. Thought playing at Long Beach State was a terrible, terrible place to hit for power, especially. Um, had really suppressed his numbers. And you know, we had this chronic need for a shortstop. We had drafted Russ Adams and Aaron Hill in the first rounds in 02 and 03. Uh, you know, Adams just didn't work out at all. Hill turned out to be a pretty good player, but really was never a shortstop. It was his footwork, especially, was never going to work at short. So this guy's the solution to a problem and he's high upside and um, and I feel bit felt better about taking him than Romero, who I'd also seen and liked for what he was, but this guy's a you know mid-rotation starter at best without more ceiling. But you know, it was a situation where, and this is Richardi is not alone in this. The GM went, saw each player once, and couldn't overlook what he'd seen himself was a bit of an availability bias, right? I saw these players and he let his personal observations based on one look each overrule uh, or do, or just obviate any other opinions in the room. And that was very frustrating. It was extremely frustrating to me, not just that I thought we were taking the wrong player, which I did, but that's not a process, right? You have a scouting director and a scouting staff and you ask those people to go out and spend the summer fall and especially spring evaluating players. And if you as the boss come in at the last second and just basically cut them off at the knees and say, no, we're taking the player I want to take. I mean, that's not really a good way to run an organization. It's not a good way to manage people. And I think it's a poor process in terms of, you know, if you're just trying to make the right decisions and get the best players into your organization. No, I love that. And thank you for, for sharing that. And so I, I think that, that I, I know I am really curious about the scouting department and 
you know, what, what the best scouts do and what they're looking for. But I, so during the quarantine, we had different calls with different scouts. And and so one of the questions that I was really curious about Mm -hmm. was we have now access to just about every piece of data that you could, you know, possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. So when you go to these games, what are you looking for? And so I'd love to hear your opinion on that because, you know, on paper, you can look at literally every metric that you could possibly get on players, especially if they're going to be high on your board, you want everything. So then you want to go and watch them. What, you know, what are you looking for? And and I'd love to hear your perspective on when you go to a game and you're watching prospects, what stands out to you? What do you like to watch for? What do you like to see? And just kind of walk us through your process of, of how you evaluate them. So I have not really changed how I evaluate players when I actually go to games. However, I do change my process after going to games. So I still go and scout kind of the way that I have always scouted, which is I go, I, I generally go in with some target players in mind um, just because my you know response, I'm one person responsible for knowing about the whole world of prospects. So I have to be pretty targeted just for efficiency's sake. So I go in and I know who I'm looking at specifically. And that does simplify the task as opposed to a pro scout who might be asked to team sheet an entire roster and write something up on all 25 players on a, or whatever it is on a minor league roster, which I've never thought was very efficient anyway. Most of them are org players. They're not good. They're, you know, not worth the scouts time. I'd rather have my scouts spending more time on a player who's got a chance to make the big leagues and we might actually acquire. Mm -hmm. Don't scout Mike Trout. I think we got that one. But also don't scout the guy who's never going to get out of A-ball, right? Spend all your time on the players in between who might change organizations at some point, who might be available in trade, and who also have a chance to make the big leagues somewhere. So, and then I go in and I, you know, where I sit, or do I sit sit behind the plate if I'm scouting a pitcher? I sit up the lines if I'm scouting hit primarily hitters. I'll move back and forth quite a bit. Uh, I've certainly argued with a handful of ushers over the years who just didn't, who were like, you know, why are you standing there? You can't stand there, right, sit sure. down. And it's, yeah, it's like immediate, this is immediate. Pa- I'm allowed to be here. Stop it. Stop. Yeah. It's great. It's really fun. I really enjoy that part of the job. Anyway. <laughs> and then evaluate stuff, mechanics, skills, and a little bit on you know, the makeup stuff that I think matters. What do I see? The player who doesn't respond well to adversity, who carries an at-bat out to the field, who, hey, the guy didn't make the double play behind me, and now I got to throw the next pitch 102 miles an hour. Some of those are, are pretty obvious, but some aren't. And I always say a lot of it is, it's very hard to explain, but I've been doing this for almost 20 years now. And so I just see a lot of stuff without maybe being able to, immediately articulated, but I'll know walking out, hey, I particularly liked or didn't like what I saw from that player. And I'll take notes on, you know, each of a pitcher's pitches and the velocities and what I saw from movement and how hitters reacted. I'll take notes on, you know, any hitter, everything he does, every swing, every time he touches the ball in the field, what I think his swing looks like, how he handled at bats, approaches, pitch types. And then afterwards, I'll try to get information say on, Hey, I thought that pitcher's curveball was pretty tight rotation. What's the actual spin rate though? My eyes are not as good as a track man style device. So I want to confirm, I don't want to go out there and say, this guy's got really good spin on his curveball. And it turns out he doesn't, right? We can actually answer that question now. So I guess some of it is just a, a pride thing. I want to be accurate and I want to be embarrassed. And, but second is, of course, I just want to know, right? If we're trying to make the best possible projections on players, then I should collect all possible sources of evidence. Sometimes I'll just go right to a team. I remember talking to a Yankees person about DV Garcia and saying, what that, why do hitters cut through his fastball so much? Is it a spin rate thing? And it's not. Actually, his fastball secondary characteristics are kind of ordinary. He's got exceptional deception. I mean, everything seems to come out of the same slot. He hides the ball really well. It's why I think it still works, even though he does a lot of things I generally wouldn't like in starters. But Man, hitters do not see the ball out of his hand. It's kind of funny to watch. There's a guy named Zach Lothar in the Orioles system. He's in the other direction. He doesn't throw very hard, but he's got big spin on the fastball and huge extension out front. He's in the top, I don't know, 2 or 3%, I think, in all of the minors. Don't quote me on that, but he's pretty high up there. And so the first time I saw him in pro ball, he'd just been drafted a few weeks earlier, and he goes nine up, nine down, and hitters are cutting through it like he's throwing 98, and he's basically sitting 89. You know what? 
This guy's going to have some challenges as he moves up the ladder. But A, the hitters just told me something. And B, I have some supporting evidence now too, why that fastball is playing so far above its velocity. So, I mean, I think that's probably the right process for me at this point um, because I don't have access to all the data. And of course, I can't see all the players. But if I were, say, running a pro scouting department, not every team has those anymore, which is incredibly frustrating. But I would tell scouts a bit of the same. Go see the players first without prejudice. Come back and we can help you. We can have somebody in R&D maybe who's assigned to work with you. Okay, hey, I thought this guy had really good spin on his slider. What's the actual spin rate on a slider? Marry those two together so that's in the scouting report. Now, if the scout saw what he thought was good spin and it turns out it was only like, okay, spin, that's still information. I want to know. For one, for evaluating scout long term, and two, hey, if the scout thinks it's got pretty good spin, maybe hitters will react to it as if it has pretty good spin. Maybe there's another characteristic. We could just be putting the wrong name to it, for example. But we have all this data. We should not be ignore. We have access to this data, this pro scouting data. We should not be ignoring it so cavalierly, uh, as teams who've eliminated pro scouting are very clearly doing. Sure, no, and I love to hear you know your process and your mindset within that. And, and so if we're, if we were going to rewind back to whenever you were learning to scout players, I'm sure you, you took on the advice from, you know, scouts that have been doing it for a long time. Mm -hmm. Was there anything that stood out that you were like, this is something that I still use today, or this is something that I'll never forget? Um, Ooh, that's a good question. Um, LaCava, who I've mentioned earlier, uh, was really good at trying to get me out of black and white thinking on players where it's like, well, if a player does this, a player has a huge hand hitch in his swing. Is that a kill? Does that just kill him for you? And he said, no, 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 it's not, it's not like that. Mm -hmm. Um, That we're not just, you know, he, he's not looking for reasons to just eliminate players Um, that he's much more interested in. Um, uh, you know, what can the player get around it then? Do I, instead of looking for reasons to not like players, look for reasons to like players. I, I don't like know that. if he ever actually said that to me explicitly. Other players, other scouts did say that, but LaCava's philosophy essentially amounts to that. Even though he's a pretty tough grader of players, particularly of hitters. But show me what players, like let, let players show us what they can do. And then... Uh, you know, if you walk out of a ballpark and say this guy can't hit and it's because of that hitch in his swing, okay, sure. I was watching video of uh, Ismail Mena who was in the U Darvish trade because um, I've never seen him live. And I'm watching video and I'm looking at where his hands are and I'm thinking that guy's going to have a very tough time hitting. Either he's going to have to cheat a lot on fastballs and miss every breaking pitch or he's just going to be behind velocity a lot. It's a long swing. It's a long way to get from his load position to get the bat head into the zone. But I didn't say he's terrible. Maybe he gets around that. Maybe he's got such exceptional hand-eye or he's got quick wrists or who knows. You have to let it play out a little bit too. Now, would I value him highly in a trade today? Of course not because of my scouting evaluation. But I would also not say he has no value or I don't want that player at any price. It is simply, I'd value him maybe a little differently and then let his performance as he moves up the ladder sort of play out a, a little differently and see uh, and see what uh, how that develops, how whether that particular issue I saw in his swing affects him adversely as he's facing better and better pitching and moving up the ladder. So just just going into the ballpark with the idea that you're going to like some players, it's a pr- it's a much better way to scout as opposed to going to a ballpark and looking for ways to just eliminate them. No, and I think that that, you know, with our audience with the coaches, that's a that's something that I think that we we don't do a great job of. I know that I'm guilty of finding all the things that a player does wrong mm-hmm. instead of looking at you know, okay, so how can, how is this player valuable and how can they help us? How can we, how can we utilize their strengths in a way that, you know, from a coaching side helps them to, you know, move up the ladder and pro ball or helps the mm-hmm. team win or, or, and gets him more playing time, you know, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I did, I, I wanted to ask you about cognitive biases because I, you, you've written it uh, several different times in, in your books. And, and so 
I'm curious on, you know, can you one explain how that is from a, from a scouting perspective to our guests and then how can we do a better job of getting over those? So the second question is a huge part of what I do in my book. Um, and my second book, the inside game, where I try to run through some of the major cognitive biases that everybody faces. And I, right. I make this point a lot. It does not matter who you are, how smart you are, how educated you are. If you're human, and if you're listening to this podcast, you probably are, you will fall prey to these biases. I fall prey to these biases and I wrote a book about them. So it is not about uh, learning to avoid these biases. It is about developing processes to recognize the biases when they occur and to make sure that you are still making better decisions free of those biases. That would include, often includes simply collecting more data. Many of those biases, availability bias and recency bias and primacy bias are very much about just using a tiny sliver of data and making a big, drawing a big conclusion off of that when simply by collecting data over a longer period or in a broader sample, maybe that includes more different opponents, for example, you would make better decisions because you'd eliminate some of the noise or randomness that is more commonly found in small samples. So everything I talk about in that book is about changing a process. And I, by explaining the biases at length with baseball examples, I hope that I allow people to, it's the, it, they think about thinking. I want people to come away from my book, from the inside game specifically, thinking about how they think and what things can I do to think differently, to mm -hmm. rethink. After I've already had the first think, which might have cognitive biases or illusions baked into it, how do I rethink and make better decisions? Some of them are changing processes maybe for a whole organization. I have a chapter on moral hazard, which is a concept from economics an economic inefficiency uh, where you know the decision maker in your business maybe makes a decision that's better for him personally, but not as good for the business as a whole. You can change your process by changing the incentive structure, by changing how he's compensated or rewarded for doing his job, for doing it well, so that the incentives shift so that he's no longer looking maybe to enrich himself or save his career, get the next contract for himself rather than uh, doing what's right for the company in the long term. All of these things come down to a, a, sh a shift in process rather than trying to learn to not fall for these biases. Because like I said, everybody does. Just recognize you're going to and say, oh, I made that mistake. Oh, I've, I'm, I'm falling for recency bias, for the latest data, for what the player just did. I mean, we're, everyone's dealing with this now, right? Is you Darvish actually an ace? He, he was, I thought he was the best player in the Nash, best pitcher in the National League in 2020. He was not that good in 2019. He was good, but he was nowhere near as good. And he, and 2020 was a shortened season. They only played 60 games. He made 12 starts. So to try to ensure that I was not falling for recency bias, I looked at some of the more granular data on his pitch types, uh, the characteristics of his pitches and where he was locating them and against whom he was using them. And that allowed me to, I think, come to the same conclusion. I think 2020 is somewhat sustainable for him that he will be a number one starter going forward, but to argue for it with stronger evidence than just the 12 starts he made in the 2020 season. No, that's really, really interesting. And I think you referenced, uh, you know, the book that has come up on the podcast several times, thinking fast and slow by Tversky and, and Kahneman. And, and that's, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's quite the heavy read as all, but I think you mentioned yes, it that is. it was <laughs> going through like front offices around baseball, which, which is, which is true. Uh, but definitely, you know, if they wanted to dig in deeper to go out and, and with baseball examples to, for your book, but if they wanted to figure out, you know, with the system one and system two, I would uh, encourage our listeners to go check that out. But one of the, one of the things that, I think is, is really interesting. And it's, it's one of those backroom conversations that, that player development has. And I think that it's, it's gaining traction because we look at like the money ball era and everybody was looking for on base percentage as that, like, how, okay, so how do, you know, the A's were ahead of finding that trade and going out and, and finding players that fit that. And I think they still do for a large part today. They, that's one of the things one of their pillars, but one of the questions that I really like to ask and, 
and it's 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 a hard question to answer, but maybe you can fill me in and help me with this. What are some different traits that we can develop? And then what are some different traits that by the time, you know, they're 18 years old or 20 years old, whenever they get into pro ball, that they can't change. So it's it's innate. They've they can't they can't really improve upon this or that. So uh, in a shorter way to ask you the question, what traits and skills and can we develop? And then what's what's innate that's just really going to stay consistent throughout the rest of their career? That's a good question because I think the answers to that has changed somewhat. And I think the advent of folks like Driveline and other people trying to do those essentially data-driven player development uh, processes, you know, they're arguing there are probably more things we can change, like altering the spin on a pitcher's fastball that were previously believed to be innate. And I do think there are some limits. I don't think you can take a pitcher who's maybe wrist is not lax enough to really break off, to really spin a, a breaking ball, particularly a curveball. Um, there's only so much you can do, right? You are bumping up against nature at some point. Um, I think that's true with bat speed as well. Maybe we can see some improvements in bat speed, but you know, I give Austin Riley often as an example of a player who's, you know, he had kind of a slider speed bat when he was an amateur. That was true when he was in the low minors. I think that's really caught up with him in the majors that he especially uh, to catch up to major league fastballs, he has to cheat occasionally, but then he's extremely vulnerable to off-speed stuff. That's nothing against him personally. I just think that is a bit of a an innate characteristic that maybe is not immutable, but is certainly much harder to change than other things like teaching pitch, pitch recognition or teaching plate discipline, which are things that we absolutely know can be taught, not to every player and not to an equal degree, but we have seen plenty of examples of guys improving in that department. We've seen pitchers add pitches. Um, you see pitchers add pitches actually quite frequently. Uh, the cutter is probably the most common example, but it's certainly not the only one. Pitchers can even change grips on existing pitches and see pretty substantial changes to those. Uh, we can see swing changes. We've seen quite a few swing changes, actually, some really substantial ones that have turned careers around. Ben Zobris is probably my favorite example. His previous swing was, uh, especially when he was in Houston's system, right, where he started, was awful. I said, nobody, nobody's going to hit like that. It, that's just unthinkable. Um, he might put the bat to the ball, but it wasn't going to do anything. And then a swing overhaul not only made him a better hitter, but started to unlock a little bit of power so that for a while, by, by wins above replacement, he was one of the top 10 players in the American League just about every year for a good stretch. So there are many things that can be changed. And I would encourage player development folks to go into every situation with every player and thinking that just about anything's on the table that, you know what? The only thing I probably can't do with this kid is make him taller. And actually that's not even true, right? If you're working with 16 year olds, they absolutely can't get taller. Sure. So, you know, there are, you can't probably can't make somebody a better athlete. I think athleticism is probably pretty innate, but you can change just about everything else. You may only make marginal improvements, but let's say, you know what? A marginal improvement to a guy's bat speed could be the difference between him getting to the big leagues and not getting to the big leagues. So I think that kind of attitude, just saying, we can try to fix anything. We won't always succeed, but we got to go in thinking we can is probably the, the best approach for player development folks. Cause often you're, you're asked to do kind of do the impossible, right? You're asked to take some clay and turn it into a Michelangelo statue. That's not easy. So, and it's the, the hardest I think to evaluate from outside. It's the easiest thing in the world to say, Hey, they were all prospects. When we put them on the bus, player development screwed them up, but that's not how the world works. <laughs> right. And, and I'm sure player development, uh, has said the same thing about, Hey, this is all we've got to work with. So it's, <laughs> it's an interesting thing, but with, within that, and again, feel free to, to tell me if I'm, if I'm off in this basis, it seems like some of the best organizations trade and target players that may have deficiencies Mm -hmm. but they know that they are good at developing those. And mm -hmm. this, again, this is a conversation that I've had a lot of different times. And, and, and you look at several different organizations that are really successful in doing that. And you're like, man, you know, that like, that is this a thing? And I, I don't know if this is new, do, or it may not be new for you in seeing this since you're in it every day. But for me, it's for the last couple of years, you're like, okay, they must be good at developing this, mm -hmm. uh, the Dodgers. And I think that they, you know, they came out and said that they like bat to ball skills because they can develop other things. And, and you look at the Astros with 
you know, increasing spin rate, they've obviously got a, a patent on that, re- mm-hmm. regardless of different ways that, that people have said that they attain that. But right. w- w- within that, I mean, it, tell me, is that what you're seeing as well? And, and if you don't mind, just kind of talk on that point a little bit. Um, it's funny you bring up the Astros thing too, because as much as there is, you know, debate, I mean, we feel like we spent a lot of time, right. Debating whether what they were doing was legitimate or not, not legitimate. Sure. Yeah. At the same time, everybody's trying to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, I find it interesting that, um, you know, they found such success with four seamers up, um, high spin four seamers up especially and started going after those guys from small colleges later in the draft. And it was almost like other teams were grumbling that they were doing it and yet nothing was, st- it's not a secret. Nothing was stopping everybody else from doing the same thing. And you know, what if, if the Astros, man, I'm probably going on a tangent here, but it just it always bugged me. It still bugs me. The Astros have essentially no scouting staff. Uh, and by the way, it's probably why their farm system is kind of in the, gutter right now like they've obviously they've traded and graduated some guys but also they haven't drafted well the last couple of years a big reason for that is they don't scout anybody and i think they're at a disadvantage in trades now basically for the same reason but for a while they were going pretty good actually because they were scouting guys they would identify r&d would identify guys and scouts would go out and say yep he is exactly what we thought he'd be and this guy's worth taking you know especially if it's a thousand dollar five thousand dollar guy from you know pencil state in the 24th round Nothing was stopping other teams from doing the same thing. And if you still operate a large scouting department, you can do exactly that and marry it with your analytics department. And I think what the Astros were doing was, you know, it's funny, they were partially led by a rocket scientist, but it wasn't actually rocket science. They found an inefficiency and the window didn't close as quickly and they just kept going after it. And then for other teams to grumble, I mean, what is, again, what is stopping you from doing exactly the same thing? Uh, and and maybe doing it better because you are because you've got a scouting staff bar- married with it, or maybe because you believe more in your player development people and you think they'll be more helpful or productive when you give them those types of players. So it just always, yeah, I'm I'm ranting a little bit, but I always did find it extremely um, frustrating when people would would act like the Astros were you know, had had sort of discovered something proprietary or something, maybe even unethical. Now this, the accusations aside, that's a little separate, but this predates that. So I'm sorry, I probably didn't actually answer your question. <laughs> no, I just sort of went on one for a moment. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. It's just like, I just, again, it, it's from the outside looking in because I haven't been in those different organizations and seen, you know, the guys that they, that they target, but they all check a few boxes. And I, I'm sure that that's not, you know, that that's not just coincidence that again, mm-hmm. I mentioned the Dodger or the Rays have like these guys that, that they really like to trade for and this and that. And, and so it's just, it, it's an interesting conversation because you're, you know, you may hear more closed door conversations than I do because you're in different mm-hmm. organizations and, and scouting and putting together your prospect lists and things like that. Uh, but it is an interesting discussion to see, you know, okay, these organizations have figured out that they can develop this skill and then they acquire players who they, who already check a couple of other boxes and they know that they can, they can do this or that. And, and I think that that's, that's a really efficient way to do things. Yes, I agree. Um, and I think the Rays, this is one of the Rays' big secrets, is that they go after those players in other organizations. Uh, you know, it's a little easy, maybe a little too facile to say as an outsider. You know, the Rays just get guys who used to be prospects and figure, well, you know, they still probably have the uh, underlying abilities that made them elite prospects in the first place. And we'll just take them in, see if we can clean them up and, and make them better. Mm-hmm. And, and that's not wrong, but I think it oversimplifies what goes on in Tampa Bay in terms of player identification and player development. And I think they're exceptional at both of those things. And if only their owner would spend some money. But you know, Austin Meadows and Tyler Glasnow, people are like, I can't believe they they ripped off the Pirates like that. People forget those guys were way down in value. They had, you know, Glasnow had flopped; he couldn't even throw strikes for a, for a bit, and Meadows. Not only had Meadows struggled a bit in the big leagues, particularly in terms of just elevating the ball, but the guy couldn't stay healthy. And that actually has continued to be true. Both guys have had trouble staying healthy since then. But both guys got a lot better when they went to Tampa. And I think that is identifying, hey, the things that made Austin Meadows a top 10 pick, the things that made both guys top 10 prospects overall in the game were still fundamentally true. And then also recognizing that um, 
there were probably characteristics about those players that they believed, hey, we we can develop this guy, these guys. We can we can work with this. They have things we like. They have things we know. Our systems are good. Our player development system is good at improving X, Y, and Z. Maybe change it. Glasnow, poor Glasnow went through about six different deliveries while he was with the Pirates. That's been a lot more consistent since he got to Tampa Bay. I think that's to the Rays' credit and to Glasnow's credit too, but particularly to the Rays' player development people. And again, it's why I was saying you know player development's one of the hardest jobs in baseball because it's unseen. When you do a good job, people often forget to credit you. When you do a bad job, people are quick to blame you. And sometimes you do a good enough job, but something else goes wrong, and people blame you anyway. No, for sure. I, I, I really, you know, those are two two great examples, and and I think it's funny. Tyler Glasnow has been in the in the uh, in the news lately for the interesting way that that he uh, that he motivates himself. Have you seen that story? I'm I'm sure you have seen that story, but I, I thought that that was really interesting and intriguing. I actually have not seen that story. No, I probably should seek it out. Yeah, it's 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 pretty good. So I, you know, it, Jeff Passan put it out, and and so mm-hmm. someone suggested that that he gets angry before it starts and, and Oh yes. And he looks at uh, Martin Shkreli's picture. Yes. yes. Yeah, it's really yeah. funny. Okay. I saw that go by on Twitter. I did. Yeah. Yes. I, and it's I, good choice. I was like, yeah, <laughs> I just, it, 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 you know, it connected me to Tyler Glasnow a little bit. Yeah, right. Like, okay, that's, that's really, <laughs> connected that's us all to him for sure. But Keith, I, I appreciate your time. And, and I know that, that again, that, that, you brought it today, and I probably ran you through the ringer a little bit with some baseball player development, which is a little different than what you know with with the scouting that you do. But I thought you did a fantastic job of oh, really you. explaining the scouting eyes for us coaches, and so it, it's given me some different things to think about, especially whenever I'm trying to help these guys with with different traits and and what you know what you guys are looking for is always interesting too. But I did want to uh, ask you a couple of questions before you go. Sure. You mentioned that uh, the thinking fast and so I guess I brought that up, but you mentioned that in your book is something that, that people are going to and reading to get you know new information or at least thinking differently about different things. Uh, I'll put your book uh, inside game in the show notes as well. But is there anything else that you would like to uh, really recommend that our listeners dig into, or anything that you found interesting lately? I know that this is this is going to air right after the. It, the it, the first of the year and mm-hmm. so people are looking to you know furiously looking to add different books to their list of things to sure. read so is there anything that you would recommend yeah you know there are two books um one is called whistling vivaldi by claude Steele, professor claude Steele. uh that's steel s-t-e-e-l-e and biased by uh, professor jennifer eberhardt they both deal with pretty similar things uh Steele's book might be a little easier to apply to the sports world but they're both dealing with um forms of implicit bias related specifically to race or race and gender. Uh, Eberhardt's book is more specifically about race. Steele is his book. I mean, he, I believe he really popularized the term known as stereotype threat, which there's some evidence that, for example, if you tell women uh, that women, that, you know, girls do worse than boys do on math tests and then give those women a math test that they will perform worse because they are essentially living down to the stereotype. This is a subconscious bias that can affect performance in lots of different spheres. The evidence on this is it exists. It is not incredibly strong, but it's strong enough to support uh, the belief that the stereotype threat is real. And I think this is particularly true for anyone who's working in the sports world. Obviously, we come, we deal with players who come from obviously are different races and the racial makeup of each sport is quite different. We come from. We deal with players who come from not just different places in a move. Come from different races. Come from different places within the United States. From different places all over the world. We deal with players who have different educational backgrounds and very different socioeconomic backgrounds. We are probably increasingly dealing with. We'll probably always be dealing with players with different sexual orientations. Maybe we're more likely to know about that going forward. I think those books are incredibly important, and those concepts should really be taught in school. So that everyone who's working with people in in any venue is just more aware of the issues that different people, different players, different employees, different students face when they walk into a classroom, a stadium, a workplace that, you know what, it's not, especially, I mean, just to bring it back to race, it's not just enough to say we're hiring more black people. That is good. It is necessary, but it is not 
sufficient and making sure that you are creating an environment that addresses the specific needs of each of your employees, regardless of their race, gender, orientation, background, et cetera, and sets them all up to succeed. If you're running a player development department, you don't care what the players look like or where they come from. You just want them all to be good, right? You want to get the most out of them that you possibly can. Well, that's going to mean being aware of some of the implicit biases that probably affect the players or affect your decision-making on those players. Are you subconsciously treating black players differently than you're treating white players? The answer is probably yes. What can you do for your process in your player development processes to try to minimize those, those differences and make sure that you're giving all players the best possible chance to succeed within your system. I love that. Thank you for sharing. I'm going to have to add those to my list. Uh, They're both short too, which is a very good thing. I love, I mean, I read long books, I read short books, but let's face it. We're all a little time pressed, especially once the season starts and I'm hoping it's going to start at some point. Right. They're both pretty short. They're like 200 pages each, which is great. Awesome. Uh, and for the listeners, I'll, I'll link those down in the show notes, but Keith, I know you, you've got to run. And, and again, thank you so much for coming on and sharing with us today. And I'll put your contact information uh, down in the show notes as well. But I do want to leave you, you know, with some time to talk to our listeners and just kind of mute myself and, and mosey out. <laughs> but <laughs> is there anything else that you'd like to tell our listeners before you go? Sure. Um, I'll just say uh, if they're looking for more of me, I, my baseball writing is all at the athletic. It requires a subscription to read. I also do a lot of freelance writing on the side, particularly about board games. You can find that at paste mostly also at Ars Technica and Vulture. If you follow me on Twitter at Keith law, or I have a Facebook page, Keith law writer. Uh, I link everything I write. I link there. I also send out irregularly a, an email newsletter. You can go to tinyletter.com slash Keith law. Uh, it's I try to say I'm going to do it every week. That never works. Um, you probably get two or three a month. But again, I also link to everything I write there, including things I write on my own site, which is called The Dish, where I write basically anything else, music, movies, books, whatever else strikes my extra game reviews, um, basically anything that isn't actually baseball. Uh, and I'll just plug my books one more time. Obviously, to thank you, you did, and I appreciate that. Um, my first was called Smart Baseball. It is a book about baseball stats and which ones are the kind of the wrong ones to use, which ones are the better ones that is now out in paperback. My second book is the inside game. It's out in hardcover. It's coming out in paperback later this spring. Uh, that is about the co cognitive biases, cognitive illusions, and how we can think better about thinking and make better decisions in our professional and personal lives. Thank you for listening to ahead of the curve. You can subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, which can include Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, or YouTube. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please share it on social media to help get the word out. Once again, thank you for joining us.